Okay, hey, hey everybody. Hi. Uh, good morning and, and welcome to our, uh, well, our, our plenary session. Uh, so my name is Mel Sabella and I just want to welcome you all here. I have a couple of just quick announcements. Um, one of the things, uh, in your envelopes you have a policy and um, a questionnaire and we'd love to get your feedback on that. So if you haven't done that yet, if you could uh, fill that out, we'd love your feedback and you just bring it to the, uh, the policy booth in the exhibit hall. And if you can't find that, you can drop it off at the registration table. Um, I also want to mention for NSHP members here, uh, we have, um, we're gonna, if you're at the meeting, you're going to get a special email from Mike Hall, our director of membership, uh, about a discount if you want to become a member. So look out for that. We'd love for you to join uh, AAPT. So uh, at this meeting, we're partnering with the National Society of Hispanic Physicists, and um, we've really enjoyed working with them. Um, so we've been working closely with um, Ramon Lopez, um, Chimena Sid, and Juan Borsiaja. And um, they've come up with some really awesome kind of activities and hopefully some of us have been able to partake in some of those things. Um, I wanted to introduce Ramon Lopez. Uh, so Ramon Lopez has been a longtime member of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Texas at, uh, at Arlington and he is the current president of NSHP. He's just going to give you uh, some quick remarks about NSHP and what they're doing, and then uh, I will introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez, who we're very lucky to have here today. So, Ramon. Thanks very much, Mel. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have NSHP meeting jointly with the AAPT, and if you are an NSHP member who is not an AAPT member, you really should be an AAPT member. I've been a very long time, as Mel said, uh, a member of AAPT. He asked me how long I've been an AAPT member, and I think it's about 25 years. Um, and in fact, one of the things that NSHP uh, is very interested in is in bringing new understandings of best practices in physics education to Hispanic serving institutions. We had a mini conference on Friday afternoon on precisely that topic of how to improve physics education at HSIs and that's an area that I think we can work very closely with AAPT in the future. We also, as Mel said, had other programming. There's a session this evening on uh, diversity and, and working with people of different cultures in your classrooms. There was yesterday a visit to Chicano Park. I don't know how many of you went to that, but I understood that it was uh, a very excellent visit. And, uh, and we look forward to partnering with uh, APT in the future. And part of this is that we have recruited one of our outstanding uh, NSHP uh, physicists, Gabby Gonzalez, who will talk about LIGO and gravitational waves. I'm very much looking forward to that presentation. So uh, NSHP is uh, a small membership organization. We've been around for about 20 years, but actually we became formally incorporated as a 501c3 just a couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get those kinds of things done, but we're now an official organization. We have grants and things like that, and we uh, operate in partnership with Sura, uh, who's our financial agent for many things. And um, so I hope that all of you enjoy the plenary talk and that in years to come, as we do more and more in partnership with AAPT, that you'll uh, take the opportunity to learn a bit more about the Hispanic physics community and how you can uh, support Hispanic students at your own institutions. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, yes, I am extremely excited to introduce our, our plenary speaker this morning. Uh, we had a chance to talk a little bit, and uh, I think we can call her Gabby, she said, so that, that's cool. Um, so yeah, so I think um, 
these are especially exciting times, I think, when we're thinking about LIGO and, and Virgo and the, and the new discoveries that are coming out. And so we're extremely happy to have her here. So she is a professor in physics uh, and astronomy at Louisiana State University. Um, and her research is in gravitational waves. And she's going to certainly be talking about that today. Um, she's been a member of the, the LIGO scientific collaboration since 97. Um, and then in 2011, she was elected uh, spokesperson for the, for the organization. Uh, she was born in Argentina, in Cordoba, and attended University of Cordoba. Um, then she came to the US uh, to pursue her uh, PhD at Syracuse University. Um, she'd been at MIT LIGO uh, as a staff scientist, and then at Penn State, uh, before joining uh, Louisiana, Louisiana State University in, in 2001. Um, she's also in, in, in lots of videos and, and stuff, and that, that's cool also. So um, she's in a documentary movie uh, made by the National Science Foundation uh, called Einstein's Messengers. Um, and she is also in a web yacht documentary that was made by the, the Museum of Natural History. Um, she also has a number of awards. Uh, she received the, um, the Boucher Award in 2007, uh, the Award for Scientific Discovery uh, in, from the National Academies of Sciences. Uh, she's also a fellow of the uh, American Physical Society and the, uh, the IOP, the Institute of Physics. So I'm really excited to have her here, and as I, I know we all are, so welcome Gabby. All right. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and I thank Mel and Ramon for inviting me. Of course, I love talking about gravitational waves, but I also love this audience that teaches physics, especially, <laughs> because that's what I like doing, too. And gravitational waves has immense opportunities for teaching physics that people seem to love. <laughs> so here it is. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to give you a bit of history uh, and, and go more or less in chronological order. There has been a lot that happened, and of course this has been a long, long time in coming. It all started, as people seem to say, September 14, 2015, but we had been working on this for more than 20 years, and we'll still work on more of these for 20 or 30 or 50 more years. This is all about Einstein's gravity, the general theory of relativity. And that seems very complicated, but actually when you break it down to the basics, it's not just easy, but it's beautiful. The theory of relativity, of course, has a very complicated mathematical structure, but the basics of it is that we don't explain the force of gravity by Newton's attraction, what we always learn first in school, because that is an instantaneous force. And although it's a very, very good approximation that works for planets, we still use it in most of astronomy, we know it's not perfect because we don't believe in instantaneous forces. And that's what the general theory of relativity solves, if you want. That's what Einstein didn't like. So this theory is about masses living in a space-time. And I've been asked many, many times now, but what is space-time? <laughs> My vision of what space-time is, is a grid that, in principle, we imagine it as a rigid grid, three-dimensional, so it's like a, uh, like a square of paper, but in three dimensions. But now imagine a little clock in each corner. And that's how we can measure distances with a grid and time with the clocks in the corners. And what Einstein said is that when you put masses in this space-time grid, the grid is not static anymore. The grid flexes around. I like to say that it's like a mattress when one goes, <laughs> when one lies down on bed in the mattress, one makes a dimple. Um, oh, that was wrong button. <laughs> one makes uh, the mattress go down, and it is that curvature, the one that makes another person in the mattress or a planet in, the, in astronomy feel a force. 
So the force is not the force, it's actually the curvature of space and time. We have to remember that it's both distances and times that are changing. And this is Einstein's explanation of why the masses go around the sun. Of course, the math is very complicated. There are very few and very, um, very few exact solutions, and most of those in, in very contrived situations. But more recently, and it took also about 50 or 60 years to solve Einstein's equations on computers, even for the simple case of two objects. If we have two objects, the two-body problem, in principle, is the simplest problem to solve. But in general relativity, this motion causes the space-time to change. And that space-time moving carries energy away from the system. So the planets, the, the, the stars that are orbiting get closer together. So it's a dynamical situation. And the approximate solution for that problem as uh, when the, the systems are far apart was well known and it took a lot of math and, and it was, uh, there were good approximations for that. But what happened when the systems got close together? That's where the problem comes. So those approximations were done by scientists doing numerical relativity, and it was only about 10 years ago that they got the solution to the merger of the two simplest objects in general relativity, which are black holes. These are black holes orbiting around each other about 300 milliseconds before merger. And what this movie shows is not just nice colors, but it shows the solution to the curvature of space-time near the black holes. And what's very non-trivial to get, how distances and times change far from the black holes. So this is near the black holes. This is far from the black holes. And here we are at the merger. And things, of course, didn't slow down. They went faster. The movie slowed down. And that's the merger. Now there is a single black hole at the end. We knew they had to merge. We just didn't know what happened at the merger. And then gravitational waves keep going out. But there's an end to that, because the final black hole, being spherically symmetric, does not emit gravitational waves. Even though it's left rotating, it does not produce these ripples in space-time. So we knew from a long time ago, even when I was an undergraduate, this solution, this approximation, we knew that far away from the system, we would see something like a sinusoidal wave that would increase in frequency and amplitude as the black holes got closer together. We kind of knew what happened afterwards, because we knew that after the merger, the final black hole does not emit gravitational waves, and we knew the last few cycles with some other approximation. But we didn't know what happened at the merger. And the surprise in here, and this is something that is beautiful in, in physics and science often, is that the solution was simple. When we drew this before these calculations, we used to draw crazy waveforms in there. We knew here, we knew here, but in the merger, it had to be crazy. You saw what the curvature did near the black holes. How could it not be crazy? However, it's very, very simple. Look at that. It's just a peak and a decay. So now we knew what to look for. That actually makes the search for gravitational waves also a bit easier, because we can have nice templates. How do we look for gravitational waves? Well, in the 70s, 50 years ago, people like Ray Weiss thought about using interferometers to measure these differences in distance. This seems to be ideal because these gravitational waves are quadrupolar, meaning that if they, change, if they make that distance longer, they make this distance shorter. And that's exactly what an interferometer does. So if these two distances are the same, the waves cancel at the output, and we don't see any light on a photodiode we put there. But if these two distances are changing because a gravitational wave is going through, then we see the light changing in here. And if these distances changed by a wavelength, then we would go 
from bright to dark to bright to dark. Of course, a wavelength seems like a small number. We use uh, infrared light, we use a micron light, so measuring a micron in what you probably know are LIGO detectors that are four kilometers long seems to be a very small strain. So interferometers are easy to use to measure gravitational waves, right? Well, no, and this was also known a long time ago, gravitational waves are really, really, really small. So small that when Einstein wrote the first paper on gravitational waves in 1916, one of his last sentences in the article was, these numbers are infinitesimally small, meaning it's no, there's no point in looking for this effect. He was looking for experimental effects that could prove his theory. Gravitational waves was not that. How small it is? Those two black holes were simul simulating black holes of about 30 solar masses, about a billion light years away, which we now know exist at about that distance. The strain, which is the measure of the amplitude of gravitational waves, is not a change in distance, it's a ratio of the change in distance divided by the distance. That ratio is 10 to the minus 21 on Earth. And that was the target sensitivity we, we knew we had to get, that or better. Now, 10 to the minus 21 is an, about an atomic diameter in the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That's how small a ratio we want to measure. Over four kilometers, it's of course a lot, lot smaller. A lot smaller than an atom. It's smaller than the nucleus of an atom, a proton. It's a part in a thousand of a proton diameter. So many astronomers and even physicists and engineers thought that, that was very, very difficult. But luckily, <laughs> some even said impossible. But luckily, enough people believed that technology would get there that in the 90s, the LIGO observatories were built in the US. And shortly afterwards, the Virgo observatory was built in Europe. There was also another European observatory, the G Observatory, but over a shorter distance. And distance here really matters because our ability to measure is measuring distances, not ratios of changes of distance to distance. So if we are limited to measure, let's say, 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is really, really small, but it was done in the 80s, it matters whether you have to divide that number by 40 meters or four kilometers, because that's what determines the strain, your ability to measure gravitational waves. And of course, four kilometers make it, makes it expensive. But the National Science Foundation, which means you all with your taxes, paid not just one, but two of these observatories. And they did that because the effect that was going to be measured was so small that to make it believable, everybody thought that you needed to measure it in two very distant observatories within the light travel time between the two, which is 10 milliseconds. So there was a Hanford Observatory built in the middle of the desert in the Hanford Reservation in Washington State and the LIGO Livingston Observatory in the middle of a forest, a logging forest in Louisiana, very close to where I live. That's where I live in Louisiana. <laughs> it's because these observatories there, apart from LSU being a very nice university. So this was built in the 90s. Light began going back and forth in the, in the 2000s, in the late 90s. We had a sensitivity not of 10 to the minus 21. We started with a sensitivity a million times worse than that. <laughs> we could only see signals within our galaxy if they existed, and we began taking data in the 2000s. Of course, we didn't see anything, but we kept improving and improving the detectors. We got 
to build a second generation of detectors in, uh, that started uh, being installed in 2010, began operating with some limited sensitivity, not the best that we want, in 2015. And now I'm telling you all this, but you probably have heard of the LIGO observatories, right? We have been in the news in the last two years. You might have heard that we announced the first discovery of gravitational waves. We announced it in 2016. We then, uh, more recently, in October 3rd, the Nobel Prize was announced for decisive contributions of these three pioneers to the, uh, to the discovery. And even more recently, but shortly afterwards, we announced in October the merger, the observation of the merger of neutron stars. So there's been a lot happening in the last two years. But it's been the effort of a very, very long effort. And a lot of people. I'm here talking to you on behalf of two collaborations, not just the LIGO scientific collaboration that I'm a member of, but the Virgo collaboration. In our field, we are very, very proud of working together. Notice that we could have decided to work in competition with Virgo, seeing who detects it first. However, we didn't, because working together, we knew that we would do better science. And we have been doing that. In our collaboration, we are more than 1,000 members. And, and we, ha we need that many. Many people think, you really need 1,000 people to detect gravitational waves? And yes, we do. We do because we need engineers who design, technicians who operate the interferometer, physicists who think not just what the, solving the problems that we have now, but solving the problems that we will have later because we keep improving our detectors. We need people who design technology, people who analyze the data, people who find methods to analyze the data better, better and we all work together. It's sometimes difficult for experimentalists to talk to astronomers, to talk to, uh, to theorists, but we do it, and we do it well. Uh, we are a democratic organization. We, the first spokesperson when the collaboration was founded in 97 was Ray Weiss. Uh, second was Peter Solson uh, from Syracuse University. He's my PhD advisor. Ray was my postdoc advisor, so I feel I'm, they are my father and grandfather academically. <laughs> um, the third spokesperson was Dave Wrightsey, who's now the di executive director of the, of the LIGO uh, Observatory. Uh, I was the fourth elected spokesperson from 2011 to 2017, and I recruited a second person as a deputy because the work was already made a lot. And in 2017, we have, we have elected a new spokesperson, David Shoemaker, who also has a deputy, Laura Cadonati, from uh, Georgia Tech. So it's a lot of people doing this. That's a message. And it's not just a simple Michelson detector. We like showing this picture, but it's four kilometers long, like I told you, in vacuum, in big vacuum tubes, so the light doesn't go and scatter from the, from the walls, although it does that a little bit. Uh, the vacuum tube, which is ultra high vacuum, it's enclosed in a, uh, in a structure to protect it from the weather, from bullets, from cars. We had all of that from fires. We had fires, cars crashing into these <laughs> bullets. Um, the laser, it's a high power laser. It's going, it, it has more than 100 watts available, although we are not using all of that. The mirrors are not simple mirrors bolted to an optical table. They are 40 kilogram heavy mirrors, state of the art, polished and coated. Uh, and hanging from a quadruple pendulum, which is hanging from an active seismic isolation system, which is all in vacuum. So this is a seismic isolation system. This is the pendulum. That is that inside that vacuum chamber. And it's not just a simple Michelson. We actually make the light go back and forth in a fabri perot cavity in each uh, arm. So it's a fabri perot Michelson. We use, uh, we operate it in what we call the dark port. So there's no light coming out if everything is, is 
It's right and there's no gravitational wave. So the light is going back to the laser. We don't let it get there. We send it back with power recycling. And now in advanced LIGO, we use signal recycling. <laughs> so this is actually a beautiful way of teaching physical optics, which I remember not liking very much when I learned it. And I love it now. <laughs> Let me show you what that means. This is a video in the control room where all the people are standing behind the camera, but there are a lot of people. This is showing the dark port. This is showing the mirrors at the end, at the X end and at the Y end. This is the Livingston control room and the interferometer is trying to get locked. That means we are pushing on the mirrors, trying to make them stay at the right place for the light to go back and forth constructively in the cavities that need to be constructive, destructively at the output, etc. Now you see bright in there. That means that the fabric peron cavities are the arms are locked. This is still bright. We are bringing it to the dark port. It's getting dimmer and dimmer. We are also increasing the laser power, so we are changing gains. And only now is about to be at the best sensitivity. That's when this is dark. And what's showing in here, this is our way of diagnosing the status of the detector, is a noise spectral density. This is a live spectrum showing the noise at each frequency. And you saw it if you were looking at it, or if you don't, you can look at it later, that it started up here, and then it went down there when we had all the systems tuned at the right place. So it takes a while to operate this. It's not a switch that you turn on and you have the detector working. It takes a lot of work. But in 2015, we had it working. This was our measure of the noise. We also like to interpret that noise as a distance, our ability to measure distance, distance to, for example, binary neutron stars coalescing. That was our target source because we knew they existed. We knew binary neutron stars existed. I don't know if you listen to that. That's not my cell phone. It's my insulin pump telling me my blood sugar is a bit high. <laughs> um, so we like to, to uh, measure our sensitivity saying, well, how far can we see a coalescence of neutron stars? Hertz Taylor which won the Nobel Prize in 93, was discovered, it was a binary neutron star system discovered in the 70s. That was the first of several binary neutron star systems. So we knew those existed, we knew they coalesced only once in a while, once every 10,000 years in a galaxy. So that was our target. This sensitivity allowed us to see about 60 megaparsecs away. That's about, you have to multiply by three to get light years, so that's about 200 million light years away. So that wasn't good enough to see, to see neutron stars. We thought, we still think that we need to see about 150 megaparsecs, which we know we can get with this technology. We just have, need more time to work harder. But this was three times better than we had ever had with initial LIGO. So we said, well, let's take some data. Let's see, what's, let's see if there is anything out there. Probably not. We said all. Oh, we all said, probably not. But let's see. We were proven wrong. <laughs> As you know, in 2015, September 14, 2015, even before we started officially taking data 24-7, we saw this. And what this shows is in, order, in blue, the light on the photodiode in Livingston, at the Livingston Observatory, and you see what you saw in the simulation before. It looks like a sine wave of increasing amplitude, increasing frequency. Notice that the period here is shorter than the period there, and then a decay. 
Now, this you can see in the data just with some minimal filtering. We have very sophisticated methods to look for small signals, but here, this was screaming at us. And not only that, you could see it in Hanford, in the orange signal. Here it's noise, so you can see it's not very similar. Here it's also noise, it's not very similar, but here it's following it, but not exactly. It's following it with a seven millisecond difference. That was a gravitational wave. The first thing we thought is somebody's playing a, a joke on us. <laughs> Who did this? Who put this in there? <laughs> I was a spokesperson and everybody was asking me, did you allow that? <laughs> we were not supposed to be doing that, and we weren't. <laughs> but it took some time to convince ourselves that this was real. And it was. It was amazing. We almost did not want to do with this, but we were prepared, I have to say. We were proud to be prepared. We didn't expect a signal, but we had procedures in place. So we were able to review all our results, make them, uh, send them to a journal, write an article, get it published just before on February 11, which I remember for two reasons. This is the main reason. It's because we gave, uh, we made the announcement of the first discovery, the first observation of gravitational waves in a press conference. It was also, and I was very proud to see the coincidence later, the first time the International Day of Women and Girls in Science was uh, celebrated. <laughs> it's celebrated every year on February 11th. <laughs> so it was really nice to be there with Ray Wise, Keith Thorne, Dave Wright, see Franz Cordova, the director of the National Science Foundation making this announcement. But now we, know, we knew this was going to be big news. We knew this was going to appear in the papers, in all the scientific journals, but we were not quite ready is for the impact this had in the popular public. And we are now very proud of that, and of course we try to use it to teach people and to talk about science and the importance of science and the importance of funding in science. But let me just give you two examples. <laughs> These are my favorite two examples. One is a dress that we didn't make it, it just appeared. There's a woman um, that has a company called Shinova, and she makes dresses and, and ties and other, uh, uh, other clothes with scientific um, motifs. And there it was, our gravitational wave. <laughs> And this is like a week, a couple of weeks after that, and everybody was telling us, where do you sell that dress? And we didn't, it, was, it wasn't us. And this was an ad that appeared in the subway in New York City and other places. It's scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If it only were that easy to find an apartment in New York City with a closing, a <laughs> walk-in closet an ad for storage space. <laughs> How many times have we seen science like this? It's something that we should keep celebrating and using. The public is interested in science when it is out there. Now, this is a scientific paper. This is what we published. This is what I showed you before, the gravitational wave in the two in the two detectors. This is a comparison to the theoretical models. This is a time frequency diagram that we like showing, where the color indicates the amplitude. This is time, this is frequency. So as the frequency increases, this goes up in frequency. As the amplitude increases, this goes up in brightness. And you can see that here, the amplitude, the calibrated amplitude of the gravitational wave is the same in the two detectors. But here, you can see that it's much brighter in Hanford than Livingston. How can that be? That's because at the time of this discovery, Hanford was a little more sensitive at these frequencies than Livingston. So the signal to noise ratio was higher in Hanford than Livingston. So you see it brighter there. 
Now, although we were very proud of this plot, we know it's a bit, it was a bit confusing because this is not the plot that proves this is a gravitational wave. It's a beautiful plot, it's a beautiful figure. But the one that really proves this, proved it is this one. How do we measure the significance of this coincidence in the two detectors? Well, we have to compare it with how often those things happen just by chance. And how do we know that? We cannot shield our detector from gravitational waves. What we do is we analyze the data for coincidences faking the time in one detector. So we add five seconds or 10 seconds to the data in one detector, and then we look for coincidences. And sometimes we find some. But if there is such a coincidence, then we know it's not astrophysical because the time difference between the two is much, much longer than the light travel time. So we look for our background. We look for how often these things happen by chance. And we do that as a function of strength. So when people ask us how many coincidences did you detect in the, this is the analysis of about 15 days of data, we measured about 10 coincidences. The strongest one was that first detection in this measure of strength. It had a strength of the signal, combined signal to noise ratio of about 23. And that we didn't, in black, we show here how many times we see these other coincidences in the millions of times that we tried, millions of different time shifts. We didn't see anything even close to that amplitude. We saw some, you see here, so th these were 10 in a million or so, at 14, 19, 20. All of those were the gravitational wave in one detector with something else in the other. So when we cut out that little, <laughs> that fraction of a second with that gravitational wave, then we have this blue background. So this was highly, highly significant. Significant. It would happen by chance only once every 700,000 years or so. That is what convinced us that this was a detection. Not that it looked like a gravitational wave. It also smells like a gravitational wave. <laughs> <laughs> now you might see that there's another one in there. This one actually we call a candidate. Because again, when you ask yourself, how often does that happen by chance? It's about once every two years. So it depends on your standards. I still call it a candidate. <laughs> now, those were not the only things that happened, uh, but, uh, not all, the only things we did. Of course, once you know it's a gravitational wave, you want to know the parameters. The parameters you know from the models that you use to compare with the data, those models have a lot of parameters. There are the two masses of the original black holes, then the mass and the spin of the final black hole, there's a distance, there's the orientation of the, of the system, there's a position on the sky, and all of these parameters are coupled one to another. So the parameter estimation is actually a difficult problem, but that is actually what also gives us these probability distributions and what gives us the errors. So you, you probably heard very often that that first detection had 29 and 36 solar masses for the original black holes and 62 for the final one, which is not 29 plus 36, right? <laughs> there are three solar masses missing in the sum, those three solar masses was the energy emitted in gravitational waves. That is what we can tell from looking at the final mass, which was 60 plus minus a few, from the initial masses, which were 20, um, 29 and 36 plus minus a few. So this is how we estimate parameters. One thing that you can tell is that the position in the sky, we cannot say much because these are only two detectors. With two detectors, you have this seven millisecond time difference, which gives you a ring in the sky. You have some phase information, which tells you, well, it's probably from this side and not from that side, but that's about it. We don't have 
the corners of a triangle. We don't have triangulation. But that's still astronomy. <laughs> we can also tell the distance. The distance for this one was 400 megaparsecs. You probably have seen the movies. This is, I think, the most popular movie. <laughs> I'll tell you that it's a beautiful movie, uh, and it shows black holes. They're black. They're not emitting light. And the stars in here, this is a scientific vis visualization. What, the, what this is showing is the effect of lensing of the black holes on the stars that are around the system. So uh, when you explain, when you show this movie, we like to say these are two black holes, they're merger, this is a final black hole. It's nice to tell people who are interested that this is actually lensing of the stars. This is how the space-time is distorted, too. Now, we saw quite a few things. We took data for four months. We wanted to do just a short data-taking run because we wanted to keep improving the sensitivity of the detectors. I told you that we aimed to have 200 megaparsec sensitivity. We had only 60 megaparsecs on September 2015. This was that candidate that we saw in October. In December 26, we saw a second detection. And those were our first two detections, three if you count the candidate, of black holes. All, both of these, and even the candidate, were mergers of black holes. And I like to say that these are the first two notes of gravity symphony. And this is what you hear, which is not very musical. And that's because that's the real sound. What, we ha what you probably heard in YouTube is this, which has an increased pitch. We added 400 hertz to the signal. Just like astronomers use blue and red to color infrared and ultraviolet and x-rays, we just made it sound nicer, adding 400 hertz. <laughs> but now you know the truth. <laughs> so we saw, we took data for four months. We saw those first two detections. We took some time to improve the sensitivity. We went up to 100 megaparsecs. Now in the Livingston detector, that became the better one. And then uh, we started taking data in in November 2016, in January 2017, January last year, just a year ago, <laughs> January 4th, we saw another black hole coalescence. On June, we saw another black hole coalescence, another one we said, <laughs> we want something different. Now, we were expecting, we knew we had to stop taking data by August 25th because we have to install some new things in the, in the LIGO detectors. But Virgo was, was planned to join us. And we were hoping they would join earlier, but they couldn't. And then we said, well, they said August 1st. That's when we joined. So we said, well, we have to stop taking data August 25th, but that will be a good trial run with three detectors. Now, it was really good because on August 1st, they joined. And on August 14, we got another black hole detection, but now with three detectors. And to show you what difference that makes is uh, like this. This is the time frequency diagram, now a lot brighter in Livingston than Hanford. Almost not there, but, but barely there in Virgo. This is a signal-to-noise ratio. This is how you prove it's there. This is actually significant, not by itself, but because it's in coincidence with this. But because we had these three detectors, look at what happens to the localization. From, for all of those black hole detections, we had more than half a ring. For this one, look at the area. <laughs> This was a strong signal. It was from two black holes, but we could localize it to a small area. And every time we made these detections, we would tell our astronomer friends, we had lots of agreements, look there. But of course, before it was, look there. <laughs> now it was, look there. <laughs> Which for astronomers is still a lot of area. That's not, it's not a small distance in a, a small area in astronomy, but it was much better than before. And that 
was what we had by August 14. We had all of these black holes of different durations, different, different strengths. The strength is measured in the amplitude of the gravitational wave. The mass is measured in the length. This one, the December 2016, was the smallest mass, um, and that was still big, 14 and 8 um, solar masses. But then, on August 17, we saw another signal that was longer. These were all less than a couple of seconds. This was 10 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds. We actually had, had it for more than 90 seconds in the data, which means these were very small masses, which means these were neutron stars. These were not black holes. That's what we had. That was amazing. This is, again, the time frequency diagram. Uh, this is our estimates of the masses, masses consistent with a solar mass, which is what neutron stars would have, and a, location, and a distance, 40 megaparsecs. 40 megaparsecs is really close. We wouldn't have detected it with initial LIGO, but we could have detected it in our first run, and we didn't. This, we were lucky. 40 megaparsecs. But the best thing was that this was seen not just with gravitational waves, but the first news we had of this was not from our detectors, but from the Fermi satellite. The Fermi satellite is always out there watching out for gamma ray bursts. It detects several gamma ray bursts, some short, some long. The long ones are supernovas, the short ones. People didn't know, but suspected they were merging neutron stars. And they had this alert even before we had looked at our data. And it sounds like this. That's our signal. That's the gamma ray signal. <laughs> Two seconds later, after having traveled 130 million light years, after two seconds, only after two seconds, there was a gamma ray burst that followed the merger. That was amazing. Again, we could tell we had good localization, so we could tell astronomers, and now they believed us because it was also in coincidence with this Fermi signal, which was weak by Fermi standards, but it was there. And then they looked at galaxies in that region, and they found this galaxy. It has a very romantic name, NGC 4994, I think. It's a <laughs> That's a galaxy. These are stars in the foreground. And this is where there wasn't anything before, and there was something there. This is in the optical, but the idea was then that this was the merger of two neutron stars that we were not seeing right on, because the gamma ray burst was not strong, so that meant that we were seeing it from the edge. But then there was a lot of other emission that would be seen by, others, by other detectors. And that's what happened. Everybody was looking. These, these uh, lines indicate measurements, but not detections. And these um, dots in here indicate detections. So this is us with LIGO. This is gamma rays. This is X-rays ray, X that came la almost last. Ultraviolet, optical. Optical came first. Uh, then infrared, but not so bright, then ultraviolet, then brighter infrared. Radio came nine days later. <laughs> this is amazing. This is a trove of information. These are gravitational and electromagnetic waves. We not only had a paper about our observation, but we also had a paper with astronomers this is the list of collaborations, not the list of authors. This paper has about 1,000 authors. This paper has about 3,500 authors. <laughs> 
but that's how science is done. This is beautiful, beautiful science. We, I won't have time to discuss the results, but we can measure the Hubble constant, not very precisely, but now we can because there's redshift from op optical and distance from gravitational waves. We can confirm models for the short gamma ray burst as coming from merger of neutron stars. We can do fundamental physics by using those, that two second difference in the gamma rays from the gravitational waves. And of course, we also appeared in the news, not as much as for the first detection, but for this, what uh, caught the attention is that in this merger of neutron stars is one of the sources, it was a missing element, a missing uh, element in the puzzle for how the heavy elements are formed. And gold is one of those heavy elements, so people lo like to talk about how gold is produced in this merger, and this was one of those in Business Insider, of course, that's <laughs> a, biased, <laughs> a biased publication, but it talked about how much, how many dollars <laughs> were produced in this merger <laughs> in gold. So I guess there's always something to make science more attractive, although I don't like this monetary value. Anyway. This is just the beginning. We are doing astronomy now. We are not just detecting black holes. We are detecting uh, neutron stars. We are going to keep improving the sensitivity of our detectors. This is the projected sensitivities for LIGO and Virgo. Uh, we are going to begin taking data again. Well, this was an optimistic date. We probably will begin taking data in late 2018 for about a year, uh, and then uh, probably reaching our target sensitivity by 2019, when we will have other detectors joining, because there is a Kagra, a Japanese detector called Kagra in Japan, which is an underground detector, which will probably begin operating 2020 or so. There's another observatory being built in India that will begin operating 2024 or so. These are very approximate and probably optimistic dates, but that's the future. It's all happening. And we know what we will detect with this. We probably will detect other things too, not just black holes and neutron stars, but supernova, continuous sources, pulsar, rotating pulsars in our galaxy, an astrophysical background of everything mixed in. There's going to be a lot. And that's not all. We also have ideas on how to build better technology, longer detectors with better technology. We call this third generation. Of course, we will need money to build this, but <laughs> this is another one of those large missions that, that we can all get together. And of course, this is just one window to wavelengths of gravitational waves. There are also other longer period gravitational waves there are uh, minute, uh, periods of minutes or of hours produced by massive black holes at the center of galaxies. Those can be seen by a space detector called LISA that will launch in the 2030s. But that's getting closer. <laughs> uh, there are supermassive black holes producing gravitational waves that can be measured by using the neutron stars, the radio signals from the neutron stars as the arms of your interferometer. That's called pulsar timing. And we can measure the early universe. For that, we probably have to rely on the cosmic microwave background and measuring the polarization. But all of these things are going on. And you will hear news of all of these things in the next few years from us for sure, but in the next decades from this. So this is the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy. It's a very, very exciting time. I wish I was a graduate student, a starting graduate student now. It's so exciting. Thank you. So that was fantastic. Um, we do have some time for some questions. Um, before we do that, I'm going to encourage people to use our microphones. 
So we have two microphones on the side, so I encourage people to line up at the microphones. Um, if you physically can't get to a microphone, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to look for you out there. Okay, yes, our first question. Could, could you tell us a little bit more of how the mirrors were actually mounted? Mounted. <laughs> yes. How how were they? How were were they fastened solidly to the earth? Uh, no. I'm talking about the re reflecting mirrors. Yeah, that's one of my favorite systems in the in the detector. Our mirrors are suspended as pendulums because a pendulum is a very good seismic isolator above its pendulum resonance because if the suspension point moves faster than that, then the pendulum doesn't move as much. So we hang it not just in a simple pendulum, but in a quadruple pendulum. We hang this from another mass, from blades, from blades. I cannot reach that far. <laughs> the mirror is made of fused silica, and to avoid thermal noise, uh, we need to have very few energy loss mechanisms, so what we do is we monolithically weld four fibers, four glass fibers. So the mirror is hanging from four glass fibers from the next mass, which is hanging from metal fibers from the blades. It's a beautiful system. <laughs> right, we'll go to this side. Could you talk about determining distance as a parameter and the uncertainties in the distances? Uncertainties are large. About 50 percent, <laughs> actually more like 30 percent. But of course, this is astronomy, so that's not so bad. <laughs> and actually, the, the distance has to do with the amplitude of the gravitational wave. We know from the models, so we need the models. So we know, from the models, we know how strong they are when they are emitted. We know from our calibration how big they are when they are here. So that gives us the distance. It is, however, coupled especially to the orientation of the, of the orbit. If the orbit is parallel to the surface of the detector, then we have a much larger signal than if the orbit is tilted. So there's an, uh, that's where most of the uncertainty comes from. Why is there a nine-day uh, lag in the radio? Why is that what, sorry? You said the radio signal comes nine days later? The radius of? <laughs> Oh, the radio waves. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not an astronomer, but the model for what's called the kilonova, which is the, the kilonova, is, um, it, it's a model for the merger of neutron stars emitting first the electromagnetic emission of the, um, uh, the fast-moving particles, but then there's what they call a cocoon. <laughs> Uh, that involves the, uh, the system and grows much more slowly, and those are the ones that emit the radio waves, and that's why they came a lot later. However, I'm talking from having read our papers, so you should <laughs> ask an astronomer. <laughs> Is the vacuum on the moon sufficiently low to be able to build a very long-armed interferometer on the moon without a tube? Well, I haven't thought about the vacuum, probably so. However, the problem with these detectors, uh, certainly the seismic noise would be a lot lower. Uh, the problem with these detectors is that you have to tinker with them all the time. <laughs> and getting people to the moon <laughs> would not only be difficult to convince, but also very, very expensive. So it hasn't been considered as a realistic possibility now, at least. So uh, now that you've mastered the collisions, both black hole, black hole, and neutron star, neutron star, are you still looking for other possible sources like um, supernovas or neutron star and isotropy or anything like that? Oh, yes. We are looking for all the sources all the time. We have analyzed the data from the first observing run from all, for all sources, and we have not seen anything, although there are still more sensitive uh, searches for uh, rotating, for continuous signals from rotating stars. So there might be surprises in that. We don't know yet. We haven't finished analyzing the second observing run yet. So yes, we analyze, we search for everything. 
and we'll keep doing that. So I'm afraid we only have time for one more question. I'm sorry, but yes. Um, are there physics beyond the standard model that you envision being able to test with the observation of gravitational wave? Well, I'm not sure about the standard model, but my nuclear physicist friends say, tell me that there's a lot to be learned for, for the nuclear physics in the merger of neutron stars. Of course, we need a lot stronger detections and more statistics, but um, it's not quite the standard model, <laughs> but it's still very exciting physics. <laughs> I was the first one to raise my hand, so please forgive me. As a physics teacher, how do you explain conceptually these gravitational waves to your students? I like starting from this description of Einstein's gravity as how the masses deform the space-time, and then it's those deformations that travel away carrying, those are the gravitational waves that we measure here on Earth, measuring very, very small distortions of distance. I think it's a beautiful way, uh, and people are interested, they are amazed at learning about Einstein's theory, so I think this can be very effectively used for teaching. But you can tell me better than I can. <laughs> so let us thank uh, Gabby again. Thank you. Okay, uh, we encourage folks to stay for our next session. Um, our next session starts, well, it, it starts like right now. Uh, and um, so this is the AIP Communication Awards. You know, we heard a little about this from Gabby, about the importance of communication, talking to the public. And so uh, Kathy O'Weirden from uh, the American Institute of Physics is going to come up and maybe we'll just give people like two minutes to kind of stretch their legs and don't have Kathy. Thank <laughs> you.